Welcome to the fourth podcast in our series on satire, on the Earl of Rochester. Let's see if any of us makes it through the next hour. Um, I'm Claire Bucknell and I'm a fellow of All Souls College Oxford and as always I'm joined by Colin Burrow, also a fellow of All Souls. Hello. And today Colin, we're just going to plunge straight in. We are, right into the filth. And the natural heat of his fancy being inflamed by wine made him so extravagantly pleasant that many, to be more diverted by that humour, studied to engage him deeper and deeper in intemperance, which at length did so entirely subdue him that, as he told me, for five years together he was continually drunk. Yet he laid out his wit very freely in libels and satires in which he had a peculiar talent of mixing his wit with his malice and fitting both with such apt words that men were tempted to be pleased with them. Bishop Gilbert Burnett there, describing the subject of this podcast, John Wilmot, 2nd Earl of Rochester. Burnett spent time with Rochester when he was dying, almost certainly of uh, complications resulting from venereal disease. And just to be clear, it was when Rochester was dying, not when Burnett was dying. We just want to make absolutely clear we're yeah, not Burnett libeling Burnett didn't the have the pox, yeah. 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 Probably. Um, 1680. At the age of only 33. Um, And Burnett's record of his conversations with Rochester about God, religion and satire became a surprising late 17th century bestseller and Rochester became a celebrity. And dear old Bishop Burnett was no fan of Charles II, so his account of Rochester's life is by no means a straight transcription of what actually happened, is it? I mean, it's implicitly saying, this is how the morally directionless intimate friends of Charles lived and died. They get drunk, they swear ceaselessly, they might be pretty good at satires and lampoons, but they doubt God, they doubt the immortality of the soul, and they doubt the existence of hell, but as you'll see, eventually they come round in the end and they repent. Yeah, so Burnett shepherded Rochester through a sort of ultra convenient deathbed conversion to Christianity. After their chat, the old rake is reported as promising to forbear swearing and irreligious discourse, to worship and pray to his maker. Um, Although formerly he could not speak with any warmth without repeated oaths, which upon any sort of provocation came almost naturally from him. So uh, you just sort of wonder whether St. Peter was happy with that kind of last minute repentance. Or, the or, indeed, or indeed what Rochester would have said to St. Peter. <laughs> yeah. you know, I think his, his, his habitual oaths would have come out even then. I, I mean, we've got to say at the outset that Rochester's quite hard to talk sense about for a number of reasons. Uh, um, Claire, give us a few reasons. I shall. Um, Many of his poems are are very contextual, as satire often is. Um, Rochester, as a nobleman, was caught up in intricate political manoeuvrings between various factions at King Charles's court, so his context can feel particularly time-bound and hard to trace. And uh, sometimes getting the point of a poem or a particular obscenity can depend on knowing who was in and who was out, who was in bed with the king, literally and metaphorically. Yeah, and Charles II, of course, did have a good number of bedfellows. And I suppose another obvious problem is that the poems are often filthy. Uh, And and that doesn't just mean that they use rude words. They can be misanthropic, they can be misogynistic. uh, And one of the chief aims of the kind of satire that Rochester wrote, really, I suppose, was to shock almost at any cost. So the uh, cunt count, as we'll be calling it. I'll I'll keep a tally, that's one. Keep a tally, that's one. Um, It's going to be very high. And um, a a wide range of bodily fluids will uh, flow to and fro in his poems and in our podcast. Um, And there's a a brutality in in the pieces ascribed to him that is sort of hard to take. Um, So late in his life, you know, early 30s, he, uh, he wrote a parody of a conventional love song by a rival poet and wit whom he disliked called Sir Carr Scrope. And Scrope's song begins i cannot change as others do and concludes for such a faithful tender heart can never break can never break in vain oh and this in rochester becomes a poem which begins i swive as well as others do and swive means shag doesn't it yeah correct and then it ends my heart would never doubt in amorous rage and ecstasy to wish those eyes to wish those eyes fucked out which is, you know, a shock tactic designed to say, you know, I don't go along with this soppy nonsense, I'm above convention, and I hate Cast Grope. Yeah, and uh, I was at the National Portrait Gallery at the weekend, 
paying my respects to all my homies, as you do from time to time. Uh, and, the, and the portrait of Rochester uh, hung in there really gets that aspect of him, I think, because he's presented standing uh, with a monkey by his side and he's crowning the monkey with a laurel wreath as though the monkey is the poet. Meanwhile, the monkey is tearing pages out of a book and throwing them at Rochester. So in the world, according to Rochester, the laureate poet apes and destroys the work of others, as he did here with Scroop's poem. And Rochester did have that contemptuous, destructive side, and it's a side of him it's hard to like. There is a kind of infantilism to its defiance and its defenseness. You know, I don't care if you don't like me. And there is also a performance of an aristocratic style, you know, not giving a fuckness, which sort of says, I'm going to violate any social decorum and my own poetry to boot and try and stop me. Yeah, and we'll come back at the end of the podcast to think about the value of that combination of self-assertion and self-destructiveness and how it creates his form of satire. But I think it is worth highlighting that side of Rochester from the off, because I think critics sometimes let him off a bit lightly. I mean, they pretend it isn't there as though he was a gentle, sensitive soul and much misunderstood. Yeah. So Jermaine Greer is, is a very good reader of Rochester, but in a piece for the LRB from 1999, she uh, expands a lot of energy telling us that he was never strong, always accident prone, ill from adolescence, desperately poor, like a, like a kind of satirical tiny Tim. Mm. And then she says, nothing in the documentary as distinct from the literary record suggests that Rochester was an unusually wicked lord, which just feels like a low bar. Yeah, well, I mean, given what restoration lords got up to, that's definitely true, because the, the proverb, drunk as a lord, became a proverb at about this period. And, and Rochester was certainly complicated and he had his vulnerabilities, but there is an undeniable bit of him that says to his readers, you bourgeois cretins might be shocked by this kind of speaking, but I'm the Earl of fucking Rochester, so fuck right off. Uh, and his obscenity can be a way of just ex displaying entitlement. And, you know, it's hard to see why one should like that. And I think it's genuinely part of part of his idiom. And it creates another problem for how we talk about him, right? Because he, he garnered such a reputation for obscenity and wit during his lifetime and after that a lot of poems got ascribed to him, which he probably didn't write. Um, and poems to which he perhaps only contributed a verse or two have been taken to be entirely his work. You know, most of the pawny, profane verse that came from the court of Charles II was, was pinned on him at one time or another. Um, then poems which he actually did write have been either expurgated in print, uh, for instance, in a Baudelarized collection of 1691, which was a kind of last ditch stab on behalf of Rochester's allies at reputation management. Or they've been made even ruder than they actually were in manuscript form, you know, passed down to us in, in witnesses that we can't trust. Yeah. And uh, and I think that's a bigger problem than it might sound as well, because literary scholars over the centuries tend to prefer nice, tidy authors with clearly identifiable, identifiable herbs. And I think for many literary historians, the death of the author hasn't really happened and they want something that looks as though it belongs to a particular individual. But in the case of Rochester, what we've got is a kind of mess of print and manuscript sources. Uh, and any attempt to work out what he's doing as a satirist has to acknowledge that we don't always know exactly what he wrote. So that mischievous monkey who stands beside him in the portrait, uh, monkeys were famously imitative, apish and randy, um, must have written at least part of what's been ascribed to him. Absolutely, definitely, I'm sure. Yeah, monkey verse. Uh, but what about his life, Claire? I mean, we, we do know a bit about that, don't we? What we know, in quotation marks, about his life, sort of built up from recollections, anecdotes, ephemera, lampoons and accounts like Burnett's that are possibly biased, can't always be trusted. So we do know that Rochester got his place at court and his social position from his father's loyalty to the Stuarts during the Commonwealth. Yeah, so Rochester Sr. received the title as a reward for helping the future Charles II escape to Europe in 1651 and then served him in exile, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. But then we can't be sure about the sincerity of Rochester Jr.'s own allegiance to the king or what his politics were, whether it was just convenient for him to assume that position. Um, we know that his courtship of his eventual wife, the heiress Elizabeth Mallet, began, let's say, shakily, um, with her being forcibly abducted at Charing Cross as a teenager after her family opposed the idea of marriage to a penniless lordling. I, th I think describing that as a shaky beginning is a bit <laughs> euphemistic, Claire, really. I mean, because, you know, in this period, you just 
describe that as a rape, whether or not he violated her sexually, because rape could mean abducting an heiress from her parents, which is what Rochester was doing. It was an incredibly reckless act. The question that there is, though, whether he was behind it or his somewhat controlling mother. No, I mean, you're being a bit like Jim Greer there, I think. You're wanting to protect tiny, delicate Tim from wicked slurs. Uh, you know, his mother was definitely a powerhouse. There's no doubt about that. But I think she was much too canny to have arranged the abduction, uh, even if she wanted the match to take place, because, you know, it was a scandal. Yeah, true. At court, when he came to court after his grand tour, um, Rochester liked to profess scorn for poetry and poets in his writing. And he probably wouldn't have loved the fact that history remembers him predominantly as a poet. Um, So one of his satiric personae, Timon, um, says at one point that he never rhymed but for my pintle's sake. That is, to get laid for my penis's sake. Um, But then that attitude doesn't really square with the care and the craft that you see behind even his shorter lyrics. I think we need to bring back the word pintle, Mm. don't we? I mean, I I think you and I need to be founder members of the Society for the Restoration of Restoration Slang. Don't think you get many members, Colin. We wouldn't call them members, though, would we? We call them tarses or pintles, don't you think? (laughs) Oh, God. OK, um, let's yeah, move on rapidly. Move on quick. Um, <laughs> above and beyond all that, Rochester is hard to talk about because when we say Rochester, we mean not one thing but many. He was a brilliant role player and a ventriloquist. And this is maybe where we begin to get at what made him such a brilliant satirist. It was something of a fashion at Charles's court to dress up and play roles. So the king occasionally liked to uh, go incognito for sort of dodgy romantic reasons, as did other courtiers. Yeah, and and in the National Portrait Gallery, Rochester and his ape are hung right next door to that wonderfully loose portrait of Charles II, which is attributed, I think, to Thomas Hawker. And the king's lounging back with his scepter in the air, looking post-coitally sleepy and deeply sinister, but not really like a king. And on the other side of him in the National Portrait Gallery is Nell Gwynne, bearing most of what she's got to the world. And and Charles was a king who loved his recreations and who didn't always play kingly roles, shall we say. Yeah. Rochester, though, took dressing up to extremes. So uh, he posed successfully at various times as a City of London merchant, a porter and a tinker, <laughs> um, apparently showing up in the village of Burford with a collection of pots and pans. Perfect. Um, yeah, no, lovely. Um As well as all that, he was the only English poet, as far as we know, to attempt in real life to act like Volpone, whom we talked about in our last podcast. At some point, probably in 1675-ish, after being thrown out of of court for one of his regular indiscretions, he disguised himself as a mountebank or quack doctor, just as Volpone does in Johnson's play. And I just love the fact that he called himself Alexander Bendo. Thanks for listening to this extract from On Satire, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episode and all our other close reading series, sign up to our close reading subscription at lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.